This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Welcome and aloha. My name is Mark Schwab. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. And today we're going to talk about a private investigator who came across the sea. My program today is titled Hawaii PI, and my guest is Steve Goodnow. Steve is the founder and principal investigator of the Hawaii Investigative Group, LLC. Steve has been a private investigator in Hawaii for over 50 years. And today we're going to find out how Steve got into this business, what a Hawaii private investigator does, and how real life differs or, or not from fictional private investigators. So Steve, welcome. It's good, good to see you. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Mark. Nice to be here also. OK. First mystery that I want you to solve. Okay. How did you get to Hawaii? And, and how did you get into the business of private investigating? But first, how, how did you get to Hawaii? Well, it was one of those foggy <laughs> days in San Francisco. I boarded the uh, SS Matsonia and took a ship ride and ended up in the docks in Honolulu. Okay. That's right. how I got here. Okay. And but the interesting yeah. story is why I came. Please. And how I got into the business. Please, please, yes. Now, my father was with the FBI, the real FBI. And in the old days. In the mean, old yeah. days, and he was a field agent in Los Angeles. I always revered my father because for a major part of his career, he was a spy. Now, if you saw the movie Spy on a Bridge, starring Tom Hanks, where they captured Rudolph Abel, then traded him for the U-2 pilot, Gary Powers, that was my dad's case. Wow. And he served for years being the shadow of the actual counter-spy, which took him to Europe and all kinds of exotic places. <clears throat> so when dad, when the case was finally over, dad settled doing regular FBI work in Los Angeles, and J. Edgar Hoover, who at that time was the director of the FBI, told my father, that when he wanted to retire, he could go anywhere he wanted. And so my dad and mom, with no consultation with <laughs> myself and my siblings, decided on Hawaii. Why not? Sounded like a pretty good deal to me. I was 17 years old, just graduated from high school, and that summer we took the Matsonia to Hawaii. Now, I left immediately to go back to college. Started at Whitworth College in Spokane, did a year there, but I really felt there was something about Hawaii that was special. I liked the people that I had met. I liked, of course, the scenery, the beaches. I was young. And so I decided to come back to the University of Hawaii for a year, at least a year. So my sophomore year of college, I spent it at the University of Hawaii. You'll notice my hat. I'm a big booster of okay. the University of Hawaii and its sports programs. In any event, I came back to Hawaii, spent a great year, but I missed that small college atmosphere and a certain lady that used to live, uh, that lived there. And so I decided to go back to Whitworth where I graduated. Well, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was good in speech. I was good in political science. I liked politics. So I decided I'd become a teacher. And so I taught school for three years. But after three years, I knew my calling was Hawaii. <clears throat> jumped on an airplane, now we had airplanes with jets, and flew back to Hawaii with my wife, needed to have a couple of children, and needed something to do for the summer. So that was, I think, June of 1967. Okay. So Dad said, well, I've got some work, do you want to work for me? Well, I said, sure. And, and your dad was, he's now he had, out of the FBI, mm -hmm. and, and your dad's Barry. Barry very good Barry now. Goodnow, yeah. And he had retired and started really the first legal investigative company for private investigation in Hawaii. Okay. So I jumped at the chance. And as the summer went by, I started interviewing for teaching jobs. I had a pretty good line on one. And my father came to me one day towards the end of summer and said, you know, Steve, 
would you like to stay on? You can always teach next year. Well, that was 50 years ago. <laughs> and here I am today as a private investigator. Eventually, I started my own company in competition to my dad's company, Barry wow. Goodnow and Associates, called it Lawyer's Aid. Because okay. I wanted to work with lawyers. And then I decided I wanted to go to law school. So I applied, and I knew I could probably get in Gonzaga, which was back in Spokane, where Whitworth was, because he had a night school and I had no money, so I was going to have to pay for it. Got accepted to Gonzaga and uh, was preparing to go, so my father replaced me. I had a couple of months kind of to cruise a little bit. And uh, one day I got a call from an attorney who's still practicing law here by the name of Bert Kobayashi. Bert Kobayashi Jr. And Bert <laughs> said, I have a case for you. So I said, well, Bert, I, I've just resigned from my dad's company, but Bert is, I call <laughs> Bert the bulldog of Hawaii attorneys. He's very insistent. He and could convince you. He said, no, I want you to work this case. So I went to my dad and I said, Dad, Bert wants me to work this case. It had to do with an accident on a bus where the bus driver hadn't filled out the accident report with all the passengers, and he had a plaintiff's case. And so Dad said, he, my dad was very wise, and I just adored him, and he said, I think you should really start your own business. So he became my partner in Lawyer's Aid. We have to go through licensing because the state of Hawaii requires licensing for private investigators. So I went through, and my dad was my principal, yet I was, in effect, competing with him. Well, I took the case from Bert, was very successful, found the witnesses. Bert was able to put his case together. And then one day, I got a call from Wally Fujiyama. Now, Wally's... And, and so you, you didn't go to law school, I, I guess. Well, yeah. I said I could... Well, no, I was getting ready to go to law school, but Wally called. Now, <laughs> those that are in the legal profession in Hawaii and have been here for a while know Wally Fujiyama. Wally was the epitome of a local attorney. He was brilliant. He was smart. And he and could he, talk to everybody. And he could talk to everyone. Yeah. Juries, clerks, didn't matter who. Yeah. And so Wally called me and he had a domestic case. And the investigator he used didn't do surveillance. Well, I had cut my teeth on surveillance, mostly insurance surveillance and workman comp and personal liability cases, because in those days there was a lot of that. And so I said, sure, I'll do it. Went up to see Wally, Mr. Fujiyama, gave me the assignment, and I won't say wh who the client was, but it was a very notable Hawaii personality. Well, one day I'm following his wife, and his wife goes out and meets this third party, and they go to the Royal, was it Royal Drive-In out there by the airport, used to be out there by a gas station, a Chevron gas station. And they order their lunches and they go to a table and they begin to passionately make out. <laughs> I slide under a car that's being worked on, I'm totally dirty, I am always have my camera ready, and start clicking pictures. So I get the pictures, get them developed. In those days, we didn't have video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get them or, or cell phones. Or, or cell yeah. phones or any of that iPhones, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I get the pictures, deliver it, and I call Mr. Fujiyama, now his secretary, who's still my friend, Harriet Suhako. Call her, set up an appointment. I go into the office. Mr. Fujiyama will see you now. Now, Wally Fujiyama was a fascinating attorney. I don't know if he ever wore, wore his shoes in his office. There he is with his feet up on his desk, a scowl on his face, working with this Caucasian or Howley investigator. And he's a very local guy. And so I have to make a decision how I'm going to present what I've found to him. So I have this package of photographs. Remember how the photographs came in a little package yeah, with yeah, the negatives? Yeah. I decide, and he's got these papers laid out in front of him, and I decide I toss them. I just toss him, right, lands right <laughs> in his lap. He looks at me with a scowl that would, you know, start World War III. He gets the pictures, he starts looking at them one by one, and you just see that scowl turn to a big smile. <laughs> and from that moment on, I was Wally Fujiyama's investigator. Ah, okay. Now, just to carry it on just a little bit, 
he was associated with Walter Chuck. Yeah. And the two were probably the most prominent local firm. They had been rejected by many of the big attorney firms in Hawaii, so they set their own up. And they, they showed had, them. They had all these yeah. local guys who all ended up to be judges, by yeah, the way, yeah, yeah. including Jim Duffy, yeah, yeah. who started with that firm as a rookie yeah. and who went on to the Supreme Court and yeah. became my best friend. Yeah. In any event, I was his investigator. Shortly after that case, I got a call from Walter Chuck, and he represented, at that time, called Kamehameha Schools, Bishop Estate. Right. They believed there was an embezzler that worked in their physical department, and he asked if I could handle that case. He was getting ready to go on the mission to China, that first big mission to China that President Nixon had set up. So he's gone for 30 days. He gives me the case. And Walter was a very serious person. And I get the case, and in the 30 days, hire a guy to help me, get an a, a administrative assistant to help me. We have an office, $75 a month down on Alakea and Queen Street. And I put the case together, and by gosh, I was able to prove that he had stolen $1.3 million. Wow. They had no idea. Yeah. I won't go into all the details, but I'll never forget sending that first bill. Now, I was charging like $10 an hour or something. <laughs> but when the bill goes out, it's for like 24 hours a day right. times 30. Yeah. So Walter gets the bill, and he has his secretary, Mrs. Chang, a force to be dealt with, <laughs> calls me up. Mr. Chang would like, I mean, Mr. Chuck would like to see you. Right, yes. So, I go over there, sit out in the waiting area, and finally, Mrs. Chang says, Mr. Goodnow, Mr. Chuck will see you. And as I walk through the office, the mood of the office, mm. you could just tell, oh, he's going to get his Okoli reamed. You know, I go into Mr. Chuck's office. I explain to him what I did, why the bill was the amount it was, and the evidence I had gathered. At the end of that meeting, big smile on his face, and he says, I want you to run with this case and take it wherever it takes you. And we come wow. out of his office, his arm is around <laughs> me. We're laughing or smiling or something, and we come out of there, and you should have seen the faces in that office. You yeah. know, what, what happened? happened? Yes. And from then on, I was the investigator for both Walter Chuck and Mr. Fujiyama, who I considered my friends till they both, both passed. Yeah. In any event, that's how I really got into the investigative profession. You got By this it. time, law school, I just had to call him and said, oh, I'll go next year. Yeah. Well, that was another next year thing. And You're still waiting, I guess. Huh? No, any, I'm not any waiting chance? anymore. Look, they tell they tell they tell jokes about lawyers, right? right. I've heard a few. I'm not going to repeat any for your <laughs> audience, right? Yeah, but you know the kind of jokes they are. But when they talk about a private investigator, it never ceases to amaze me. People come up to me, oh, that must be a very interesting profession, uh, and, and then I can tell stories. And, and I want to talk a little bit more about that, and also I want to talk a little bit more about how you differ from Sam Spade. Oh, in, 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 a, in a minute. We're going to take a break right now. Okay? So, All right. So hold that thought, and then I want to talk a little bit more about the stuff that dreams are made of. Okay? All right. Thank you. But, Grandmother, what big eyes you have. She said. What are you doing? <laughs> Research says reading from birth accelerates our baby's brain development. Push. Ah! Read aloud 15 minutes. Every child, every parent, every day. I said I could play, so any chance to play at all, you know, that's my life. I love music. Yeah, I saw we do it. Hey, hey, baby, that's you. I want to know, will you watch my show? I hope you do. It's on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock, and it's out of the comfort zone, and I'll be your host, R.B. Kelly. See you there. Welcome back. I'm Mark Shklov, host of 
Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea, and I am with Steve Goodenow, who is the principal of Hawaii Investigative Group, LLC, and we're talking about private investigators, Steve, and you've told us how you got involved in the business, and you know, I love private investigator movies. I, I love Sam Spade. I love the Maltese Falcon, okay? I love it. Um, I want to know, is there any difference? And, and I don't want, you know, you're going to kid me, I know, but you watch these movies, and what's, what's real life like? What, what, what is the difference, and have you ever found a Maltese Falcon? Actually, I did. Hmm. Well, I went well. to Malta. I bought one in this tourist <laughs> shop. Let me tell you this story. The future president of the United States, Barack Obama, is in town. I like basketball. I go to all the basketball games. He likes basketball. He was at a basketball game I was at. And I went up during halftime to get a Pepsi for my wife. And standing up, talking to the president, or the future president, was Brooks Bear, a reporter here in Hawaii. I know Brooks, known him for years. I don't want to bother Barack Obama. You know, I tend to stay away from that kind of stuff. So I'm walking up the steps and get out to the mezzanine, and Brooks says, Steve, come over here. I want you to meet Barack. So I'm introduced to Barack Obama, and here's what Brooks Baird says. Barack, I want you to meet Steve Goodnow, the real Magnum P.I. <laughs> <laughs> what I liked about the future president, he asked me, well, what do you do? So for about five or ten minutes, I was telling him the kind of work I did. He asked very intelligent questions, and I had a very favorable impression of him. So, so what, well, what, what is the difference? I mean, what, what well, is the difference between you and Magnum P.I. Or, or, or not? Well, you know, time has changed the investigative field. When you first start out, just like any business, you're trying to take any kind of case so you can develop some income, right? Get employees, establish yourself in the community, especially for me because I'd called myself Lawyer's Aid. Now, I wasn't going to call myself Good Now or anything else because I didn't want to really conflict with my dad. We, had, we maintained a very good relationship. We talked at Thanksgiving and Christmas, but we talked about nice things, grandkids, all those things. We stayed away from cases. Every once in a while, I'd have to refer a case to Dad. Dad would refer a case to me if there was a conflict. But the work that I began to develop was related to the legal profession and their need. And the thing I really love about my job, the thing if it wasn't this way, I probably would have retired a long time ago, was that you wait in anticipation of the phone call. Someone like yourself, because you've called me a number of times in the past, Bert Kobayashi still calls me, could be Woody Soldner for a plaintiff's case, a business case, I get calls, and it's that call, it's getting the case. And each it's exciting. one is different. Yeah. Each one is different, right? And I'm not the smartest investigator in the world, I readily admit that, but I hire the smartest people in the world. And secondly, what I'm good at is managing and figuring out a solution. What is the problem? How do you solve it? How do you give the attorney factual, objective information so they can represent their client? And that's what I do. I don't mince the facts. Facts say this, this is what they are, and I do that. And I think that reputation is kind of carried over to today. Now, the difference between what you see in TV was there's always beautiful women. Well, there's beautiful women in my <laughs> life, too. In fact, um, the story of how I met my wife, Wendy, who is your classmate, is kind of an example of that. I had to travel to the mainland. On a case. On a case. Yeah. So my mother, who was a teacher, worked part-time at a travel agency run by Wendy's mother, Marnie Guy. And so I was dealing with actually somebody else in the firm, but I'd always noticed this attractive woman you know, who was always busy putting trips together. And so I needed some tickets, so I called, and the person I normally worked with was out of the office, so they referred me to Wendy. So she made the reservations for me. Now, in those days, you needed an actual ticket to get on. It wasn't the email kind of stuff. So, of course, I forgot to pick up the ticket. And now it's Saturday, and I'm leaving Sunday. 
what in the heck am I going to do? Wendy, here's her name, but who in the heck is Wendy? Is it Guy? I, don't, I wasn't quite sure. So I pull out the old Pokes directory. You remember that? Oh, yeah. Before computers, you pull out the old directory. I go down to H&L Travel. Well, it was something else. Total Travel was in those days. Pull it out, and I look for the officers in the company, and there's a Wendy Griffin. A little I investigative work. That's what yeah. I hear you're telling me. Yeah. That's right. So I pull that up. I run what little I can, and I find an address for her and a phone number. So I call this young lady up, and I says, I Really sorry, I forgot my ticket. She says, no problem, I'll go down to the office and deliver them to you. She says, I can't let you do that. I mean, let me, well, let me pick you up and take you to the office. I can at least do that this <laughs> Saturday, right? <laughs> so she lived over at Royal Court, which was close to where I lived. So I pick her up, we go down, I'm single. I want to put that in, make sure everyone understands that. Go down, pick her up, take her down, she gets my tickets, you know, and... I didn't know she had a boyfriend, if she had children, I didn't, I didn't, married, and I knew she wasn't married, no ring, I saw that right away. Very good investigative yeah, technique I, also, I, yeah. I started yeah. to check it out a little bit, yeah. and so I said, can I at least take you to dinner to show my appreciation? Well, we never ended up at dinner, I'm not saying we did anything, you know, that I wouldn't want to publish, but we went out, walked around, had a really nice time, and I liked this girl, and so... One thing led to another, and I married her, but my investigation found her, and then I did a little background. I said, she's perfect for me, and the rest is history. Rest is history. Our first date was a muscular dystrophy, 5,000 a table dinner, which I brought my firm to her, and she was my date. Wow. And that was, and it was a tuxedo type of affair, so that was my first That's date. So, right. And we were married subsequently, and I lived 25, 26 years, very happily. Okay, so your investigative techniques helped you win, win your wife, and, and uh, how, how have things changed in, in, the, in the profession since, since you started? Well, the real big change has been the computer, the internet, databases. That's the real change. It was at one time, I did buy my father's firm out when he okay. reached 65, called it Good Now Associate. And when I purchased the company, I set up three divisions. By that time, I had started a security company called Safeguard. We had about 400 right. and some employees. Right. Did most of downtown. Yeah. Set that up, found good people to manage it. That's the key. Yeah. I set up a company called Insurco, which was doing insurance-related business. Had good people to management. And then the Good Now operation handled general investigations. So I had these entities, and then I knew I was getting so many cases because California people intersect with Hawaii so often on California people. So I decided that I would set up two offices in the mainland in California, one in San Jose for Northern California and one in L.A. for Southern California. And I had people in line to do that, people I'd worked with, people I knew. In fact, the guy that handled the L.A. office was major crimes detail from LAPD who handled some very famous cases. You know, they had the Hillside Strangler right, case and all right. that. He did all those cases. But anyway, he was great. And so they were able to access their contacts and associates and provide information for me to give to my Hawaii clients that had stuff going on So in kind of like a nationwide network. Yeah, know? it was starting, I, you know, in visions. I had people approach me about buying the company and mm -hmm. doing all these things, but no, I didn't want to sell the company because I felt responsible to my employees, yeah. you know, keep them going. Well, AOL came out kind of after the Internet's kind of created. AOL really was the first one to utilize the Internet and databases. And they started with certain programs. It was very costly because you paid by the minute. Hmm. But I jumped on that. I had computers before a lot of people, probably even lawyers had computers. You know, they're still using the IBM Selectrix. Mm -hmm. And I, I had, I started, I, I, I first uh, computerized my databases that I had, uh, and then I began to access through AOL the mainland. Well, as you know, that's all changed. Now there are LexisNexis for lawyers. There's all kinds of databases. And I've always tried to stay ahead of the game by finding out what databases are useful for people like me. 
And it became apparent I really didn't need a California office mm. or two. Not anymore. No. And yeah. so the guy in Southern California retired, the guy in Northern California also retired. So it was perfect. I closed them down. If you go to the DCCA here, <clears throat> Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs, you can probably find them. But in any event, I closed them down and we started. I got a guy that was really good with databases and he began to expand what we could do. And of course now there's so much. Social media has, has been the big change in the last several years, right? You know, the Twitters. Look at our president, you know, and his use of Twitter. <laughs> By the way, I was interviewed for a television program in, uh, in Washington, D.C. And they asked me the question of the day, what do you think of the president's Twitter? And I said, well, I think it's great that uh, the politicians and the president are using social media. I think that's the life of the future. But I think you need to be responsible when you use it. <laughs> and I don't think he's very responsible. Anyway, that's another story. Well, let me ask you. Okay, so we got computers and all that nowadays. I understand it. But let, let's say you're on the ground here. And uh, in, in, the, in the couple minutes we have left, tell me, you're on the ground. You're doing surveillance. It's just you. What, what, what do you need as a private investigator to be successful? What, and I have people that do <coughs> surveillance now. I'm getting older, so I'm a little careful about my driving, <laughs> you know, for my wife's discussions with me. But the key thing for an investigator, it was when I started, it is today, and it will be in the future, is that you have to be able to get along with people. You have to you have to be able to talk to people. Give right? them a yeah. level of trust so that they will trust you and as I like to say, they will tell you things they won't tell their own mother. Yeah. And then you have to get them convinced that that story needs to be told to a lawyer and in many cases they'll have to go to court to tell that story. So if I have any ability, I think it's working with people. You know, when I taught school I taught the eighth grade. If you could deal with eight graders, yeah. right, you can deal with anybody, right? So I have that, that skill. That's, that's your, you, you feel what that's gave you the ability to be a good private investigator. I think you, I think you have it. My father was like that. I want to ask you one, one last question about your dad, okay? What, what advice, what advice did your dad give you about being a private investigator? What, what, what let's close off with that. What, what, what would you say? I always tell people my father taught me the basics about investigation. But he really gave me the opportunity and he allowed me to develop on my own. And when he was comfortable that I had been able to, to make that jump, he was willing to basically sell his company or merge with mine. And the best advice that he ever gave me is he said to tell the truth. The truth is your objective, and never stray from it one bit. And that's the life I live. Well, Steve, thanks very much for being my guest today. I appreciate it, and uh, we'll look forward to uh, more cases uh, going after the stuff that dreams are made of, okay? Thank you very much. You're welcome.